the rest of this is for, is for history, you know? <laughs> For future generations, yes. Okay, we are ready now, totally. Okay, fantastic, do you want me to take it away? Yeah, I do. All right, so for future generations, this is very similar to a talk I've given before. So for any who are repeat, repeat listeners, you might hear things you've heard before and I don't apologize for it because when you have a good slide deck, why do you waste it? Why would you? Sure, you? Um, but I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but first, I want to do the thing I usually do uh, whenever I thanks again, Kim, for inviting me to, to speak. I, I love coming to, to talk with the class. Uh, it's one of my, my favorite memories. I, I do miss being in in small in small rooms in, in say, uh, on campus trying to dodge your camera person while also perching on random chairs and almost falling over. Uh, I miss those those experiences and sitting in my own basement here is not quite the same. Uh, but I hope we can have the same experience. So I like to go around and just uh, for all the folks who are who are here today, like to go around and get you just to chime in. You don't have to turn your camera on if you don't want to, that's fine. But if you can just chime in and, and say uh, what your name is and what program you're in or what you're studying or, or how you're related to the course, that would be awesome just so I know how to gear the content and gear what I say to things that you you care about. So I'd just love to know what you care about and what you're up to. So if, you, if I don't know how to do this in Zoom in an effective way. So uh, I see we have seven participants. So if you just want to jump in in any order, that's fine. Or if Kim, you know how to do this in a more managed way, please, by all means. Yeah, so, so there are five students in the room and there are seven people on Zoom. So yeah, maybe, maybe it's easier to start with the Zoom contingent. And then we have my uh, iPad with which we can move closer maybe to the students. So yeah, should all work great. Better than in unpandemic conditions, you know? <laughs> Why not? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, Andrew's already chimed in. So uh, does someone else want to pop in and say what they're what they're up to now? Hey, uh, I'm Matthew. Uh, I'm a graduate student in biomedical engineering. Um, so interested in engineering and, and medicine. Hello, um, I'm Samadhi. I'm a computing science student. Uh, yeah, that's my background. <laughs> <laughs> that explains everything, I would say. Everything yeah. about me. And yet, yeah. my cat. She's going to be bothering me today, so that's okay, fine. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Okay, who else do we have? Hey, uh, I'm Gaurav. I'm a second year medical student, and I'm really loving the classes so far. And uh, hopefully, I'll enjoy today's Great. lecture too. Thank you. Great. Okay, to some of the students in the room, uh, so there's a microphone there. You can pass from person to person. Yeah, and if you want to point that toward, yeah, so, so we'll get some semblance. You may not be able to see exactly what the people look like, but you'll have a big idea. Yeah. Does this microphone work? Uh, I, it looks to me like it needs to be turned on. Yeah. There you there go. go. Okay. Hi, my name is Sean. I'm studying cultural studies. Okay. Hi, Hi my name is Talani and I'm in my third year of neuroscience. Hello, my name is Chan. I'm in third year of biochemistry and I took this class because I'm in Ames and uh, Dr. Solis gave a talk for Ames before. Wow. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Tasmeen. I'm in animal biology, so just a different kind of cross section between bio, like sciences and the technology. Mm -hmm. All right, and I am Imre. I am also in my third year of neuroscience, and I'm controlling the camera, so you get the best angle of me. Wow! Good. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so so those are the people, Patrick. Yeah, that was awesome. Thanks, folks, for chiming in. I really appreciate that, and I like it. Feels much more, uh, especially given that that we're all distributed all over the place. It's it's much more personal when we do it this way, and and also I can sculpt the talk a little bit better to to what you are doing and what you what I I infer you might care about. So I'm going to try to share my screen, and we'll see if that actually works. Um, ooh, that looks like a yeah, no, that's a Chrome tab. I like that. That looks like a thing I can. 
Yeah, that looks like something. <laughs> yeah, cool. We can't hear you. You're muted now. Yeah. Your 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 graphics are great, but your audio is is non-existent. So let's see. Okay, it looks like I can't talk and present at the same time. No, we can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah, yeah. But no, we're 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 hearing you now. Yeah, if if your um, uh, computer has low memory, then it does do trade-offs like that. It it'll let you do anything, but not two of those things at the same time. So cool. Yeah. This is a new. This is a new high performance machine, so it should be fine. Uh, but I can't actually share my screen and talk at the same time. Um, yeah. huh. So I'm going to log in with another device okay. for the uh, presentation, if that's all right. I'm just going to sure. boot this up on an iPad. Sorry for yeah. the delay, everyone. But I'm, I'm as confused about this as you are, but I usually <laughs> use Google Meet, so I have no idea why this is happening. Okay. Yeah. But it'll take two seconds. So yeah, yeah. I promise okay. you, not, not too bad. You'll just have to deal with my iPad screen sharing instead. And okay. there we go. Okay, and there we go. Okay, and I'm going to log in here with Zoom on this machine. So I'm just talking you through it so you're not bored while I actually try to boot up another Zoom instance on another device. Yeah, but, but your, your uh, screen sharing from your previous device showing the, the first. Yeah. yeah, 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 I can't advance it. It won't let it said it's actually paused. Your screen sharing is paused. So it, it, it uh, effectively, right. Right. I'll get, I'll get rid okay. of it. There. You go. there. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and you get no audio on this one. I'm going to share my screen, share content. Okay. Okay. Screen. Okay. Start broadcast. Okay. You should get a screen. There you go. You should see that. And we should go to slides. And now, ideally, you're going to see first there. And now you should see my screen. Yes. And you should we hear me. Are, are, yes, we are seeing all those things. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Well, then I think we're probably ready to commence, if that's okay. Kim, does yep. it look like green light on your end? Okay. Absolutely. Checks all. <laughs> cool. So I'm going to take you. I usually play sort of this, this game with myself before I give this talk. And I think about the context. I think about conversations I've had here with Dr. Solez over the months leading up to it. And I try to pick which one of the talks I feel like I'd like to share on a given day. Um, today, I thought I'd go back to this one. I gave it for medical grand rounds uh, in the Department of Medicine and, and Alberta Health Services in the, in the fall of last year. And so I figured that's been about a year and I'd like to uh, loop back to it and and share it with you all here. I hope that's okay, Kim, if this is a, yeah, a, a good topic for today. And uh, I don't know yet, I usually ask whether Osmar has already filled everyone in in the wonders of artificial intelligence. And he all has, of the applications. and oh, okay. uh, Rich Sutton also, yeah. Great. Okay. So I don't need that as background then. So I really do want to then focus today on, on how AI could impact medicine. I think this is very timely, especially given the state of the world right now. Um, and in doing so, I'm going to give you some definitions, what I think are some implications of advanced intelligence systems in the, in the medical arena, and also some, some potential for future impact. Um, okay. Let's see. Make sure everything's switching. Great. Um, just again, as a full disclaimer here, uh, I am a senior staff research scientist and office co-lead of Alberta's DeepMind office and also affiliated with the board of the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. That shouldn't really change anything about how you interpret my talk today, and I'm not affiliated with any medical organizations, just so you know. Um, learning objectives for today are, are really threefold. I I'm hoping that primarily you're going to be able to, and you probably already can, define AI and machine learning 
and related concepts. This is, I think, something that I hope you get out of this whole course, not just my lecture, um, that I hope you're going to be able to define and describe and discuss some of the defining characteristics of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And this, I, I hope to be at a higher level of abstraction, perhaps, than you've seen so far, so that you can composite this with what you already know. And I also hope you'll be able to describe and discuss how AI has been applied specifically in medicine and very specifically with regard to the area of medicine that, that I work most closely with, which is physical medicine and rehabilitation. So hopefully that's okay. Um, I'm gonna get, Kim, I'm gonna use you as a thumbs as a no, proxy thumbs up. No. I think I've lost view of everyone else. Uh, maybe I can change that. Let me let me try this. Oh no, hold on. Side by side gallery. I can see other faces. <laughs> okay, cool. Hi everyone else that I can now see. Great. I'm gonna wave at you. All right, learning objectives too. So some of the supplementary objectives as well, I think these are these are sort of add-on objectives, so I put them here anyway. Uh, I do want you to be able to sort of estimate how intelligent system technology is going to change what you do over the next five, 10 years, not even the, the, the next couple of years, and be able to find and cite appropriate resources. I put lots of links on the slides that I'm gonna share with you, uh, so you can actually go back. Um, if you wanna find these slides, they're already on my website. Just look for the Medical Grand Rounds talk and you should be able to grab a PDF. So don't worry about jotting down any of the references. Like you can easily find them on my slides or if not, I can send them in email form as well. So just please know that you have, we'll have resources. Cool. So my usual motivating slide and we'll see if screen sharing works here. Oh, it's actually working. I can see yeah. this um, uh, is that this is one of my, my favorite sort of motivating slides. I'm gonna give you a series of visual examples first before I dive into the content that humor me in that approach. But this is one of the videos I find very compelling. It's an older video now. Um, it wasn't when I first started using it, but this is uh, Jan Sherman, a participant with the BrainGate project at University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and this is an example of direct brain computer interfaces. So you can see those sort of gray, those gray interfaces on the top of Jan's head. Those are devices that are directly interfacing with the surface of her brain. And she's using those devices to feed herself a chocolate bar. If the video keeps playing a bit longer, you'll see Jan actually like eating silly string. There's a, a video where she fist bumps a doctor and, and sort shapes using that robotic arm. But, but Jan, what's really, I think, exciting is that, that Jan's able to do this using her thoughts. Jan can't move the rest of her body. So she's, she's in fact paralyzed from the neck down. And this is an example of, of a true direct brain computer interface. Uh, I'll switch, I'll switch sort of foveation here a little bit and, uh, and, and say that like that was an example of, of interfacing with the brain to, to control an extra function. There's been a lot of work as well recently and, and over some time on, on things like memory prosthesis, looking at, at technology and, and computing technology that in fact directly starts to augment or replace damaged cognitive functions. So this is like uh, Teddy Berger and others have looked at, at a like long-term memory consolidation models at, at actual technologies that will be interfacing directly with the brain to replace, restore, or extend the function of brain regions that, that previously existed inside the brain and might've been lost due to say traumatic brain injury. So first example we had was uh, uh, the central nervous system interfacing via some system magic sparkle to the outside world control of a robotic device. Here we see the brain interfacing with itself by way of a, of a external module. There are examples that are closer to the line of work that I do. This is a brain body machine interfaces from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, but where we can start to see the peripheral nervous system uh, being used as a, as a mediator or a way that a person might begin to control a, a robotic device like the one you're seeing now on, this, on the, the frozen background of the slide, a, a robotic prosthesis. Uh, you may also see uh, direct integration of those devices with the muscles, nerves, and bones of the body. So not just a prosthesis that is strapped on, but here's an example of, again, from APL, of osseointegration of a prosthetic device that is directly integrated the bone structure of the human body. And there's examples from other, uh, I'll, I'll reference slides later, where this is actually interfacing directly with the, the muscles and the nerves by way of this physical interface, this physical connection. This is someone that's in, interacting with assistive technology uh, by way of direct coupling to their bone structure and electrical coupling to their muscles. Uh, more examples that you might see, uh, you may be more familiar with or maybe not. Uh, in the first slide, I showed you an example of brain computer interfaces where the brain was, was used uh, by way of, of com computing and electrical technology to control a robotic device. With functional electrical stimulation, the same thing can happen. But in this case, the example here I'm showing you that was published in The Lancet is someone that is using those same kind of direct interfaces to their brain to control their own body 
people who may have been been paralyzed from the neck down, unable to control their body, you can think of this almost as a supplementary nervous system. A, a nervous system is under control of their brain, but that bypasses all of the nerves that might be that might not be be doing their usual jobs. It allows the person to effectively stimulate the muscles and nerves of their nervous system and receive feedback from that downstream nervous system that's now decoupled from the rest of their the rest of cognitive processing. I'm gonna switch slides here. Uh, I've showed you a lot of wires so far. You've seen quite a few wires. Uh, some of these devices have been demonstrated wherein the actual like recording or sensing technology is implanted directly inside the, the tissue of the body. This is a, a scan showing some of the IMEs electrodes, or these are essentially electrodes that, me that measure muscle activation. And they don't have wires. They are like wirelessly talking to either each other or to the surface of the skin, whereby they can inform, they can actually sense muscle contractions in the body and inform assistive technologies. Some of you are probably very familiar with, with, uh, with EEG or direct recording from the surface of the brain. Uh, this is a, an example from EPFL uh, where they are looking at brain controlled wheelchairs where someone might be using a, a BCI cap or a, an EEG cap to drive a wheelchair around. Again, worked by Jose Delar Milan uh, and look at, at the way that that wheelchair might work with the person to actually do navigation in the world. Uh, and I'm going to highlight something here. I'm just showing you again. This is the, my whirlwind, my whirlwind tour of a variety of different uh, of different assistive technologies. And I, I promise you, there's a there's a point. This is why I'm actually drawing you through this journey. Um, what I've showed you so far are predominantly research devices. These are devices that are largely used in laboratories. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't devices that are recording and interfacing with the human body in the assistive technology realm that are now clinically deployed. Devices like the one I'm showing you here, they're actually robotic limbs that people wear on a daily basis, wherein those limbs are adapting and changing in response to what that person needs. Uh, and in fact, some of these devices, I guess you probably can't buy anymore because of different mergers and acquisitions. But at the point I made this slide, um, you could actually go out to like big box stores. You could go to your like favorite online or physical retailer if you can go, if you're actually in a place where you can go in stores. Um, and you for like, instead of spending 60 or $100,000 or a million dollars on some of the systems I showed you in previous slides, you could get a device that would actually read information from your body, either EEG information or muscle activity information, and in some cases even feedback to your body in different ways uh, to help you do things like advance through this slideshow. You could buy what amounts to assistive technology for like 200 bucks uh, at your favorite retailer. Uh, and that's a big change. So why did I show you all this? I'm gonna, I, I showed you all of these because I wanted to get to my point. The main point of the talk is that all of the examples that I showed you involve some form of machine intelligence or machine learning. Machine intelligence and machine learning was the mediator or the broker of the technology supporting the person in doing those activities of daily living or those, those different kinds of, of functional tasks that they were doing in any of the examples I showed you. Uh, it's really this picture. This is like the big picture picture of my talk uh, that I like, to, I like to bring up is that the, there's a diversity of signals that, that flow to and from the human body, especially the human body that is in need of some kind of assistive technology or rehabilitation technology. And there's also a diversity of different signals, very different in some cases than those flowing to and from the human body, that are the things that, that are inputs and outputs of the assistive machines that support that human in their daily life. If it's someone with a wheelchair, someone with a prosthetic limb, me using all of these various devices, now many of them, in fact, to give this talk, um, that the, the signal spaces coming in and out of those two parties that coupled together to, to interact with the world is quite diverse. And that machine intelligence, machine learning and AI, forms the, you can now actually see my Nest Cam. That's hilarious. All right, great. I love screen sharing. Uh, I'm sure you can watch my front yard. So the machine intelligence actually forms the glue that holds together me and what's happening in my front yard. Uh, but in this case, the, the person in need of assistive technology and the assistive technologies that support them in their daily life. So please keep this, this particular picture in mind as we go through the rest of the talk. Okay, so. Uh, I've made a lot of claims already. I've told you all about things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, and I, I didn't yet define what I mean. And I'm sure that over the course of this course, you have already uh, come across a lot of definitions maybe of artificial intelligence and machine intelligence. Um, normally at this time, I would, I would have had like a question and answer session where we would have all like gone back and forth about it. I think given the, the format here, I'll just jump right to the cut right to the chase and jump right into definitions. And 
um, much as Rich Sutton probably presented to you, maybe Rich even showed you this exact slide, um, is that McCarthy, John McCarthy really coined the term AI. And McCarthy's definition of intelligence is the computational part of the ability to achieve goals in the world. So for the rest of the talk, as I'll be presenting today, I really would like you to think about it like that, that, that intelligence as we're going to use it today is the computational part of the ability to achieve goals in the world. And with this in mind, that artificial intelligence is the science and engineering of, and I'm going to paraphrase a bit here, um, making machines that can embody that computational part of the ability to achieve goals in the world, especially computer programs that, that actually form the computational part of the ability to achieve goals in the world. Okay, so hopefully everyone, I'm just gonna pause here for a second. If there's any questions, if anyone wants to jump in or, or vehemently disagree with this framing, uh, we can do that now. Any questions? No, none from the room. Okay, cool. In that case, I'm going to keep flying through. Well, we, we should have plenty of time for Q&A at the end, given the length of this section, and also taking into account the technical difficulties at the beginning, so that should be no problem. Um, so then I am going to now open up a question for all of you, and I, I do actually now, now I do actually want some 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 pings from you. You can jump off mute, or you can throw things into the, the chat, or you can, I don't know, hold up flashcards in the room, whatever your preference is. Um, uh, like, so for you, I just gave you a definition of intelligence, but what are some of the hallmarks of intelligence? If you were to see intelligence wandering around on the street, or if you were to, to be asked to say like, well, what is it about this particular thing that convinced you it was intelligence? Uh, can, you, can you just share a couple of those now? I, I'd love some, some input from all of you as to how you're characterizing the hallmarks of intelligence. Hello. Um, so something that I have thought of is the ability to communicate between um, things that are the same as you. For example, bees com can communicate with each other. And I suppose that is a little bit of intelligence. Um, I would say the ability to synthesize information and solve problems in a, in a novel fashion. So. Um, I think I would say it's the ability to learn. So to be in a situation, react in a certain way. And then if you were put in that situation again, to react in a way that's more efficient or productive for you. also say like the ability I guess to amuse oneself so like having fun or like when you see crows doing silly things I feel like that's a sign of intelligence cool any more uh, any more folks that want to chime in uh, from the video side of things. That was great. Those are just, I want to say, first off, those are awesome. And that is like a very broad and, and multiple layers of depth in terms of the hallmarks you presented and how you, we might unpack those into, into different fundamental units of intelligence. So thanks for sharing those. Anyone else that wants to chime in? Uh, I think uh, I was just thinking like um, doing things out of the scope of what you initially had. So you had these tools but then you make something else with those tools or like something like that. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. All right, I'll give one more, one more quick call out and then we'll, we'll move on. So anyone else want, want to throw in one last comment? One more coming. I got one more comment. Um, I guess the ability to do things with intention so to like proactively think about what you're about to do and why you're going to do it very cool okay awesome this has been really this has been very good and again i did say uh just a second ago that it it, it embodies a, a lot of the the things that about intelligence that operate at many levels so things like communication uh might also entail theory of mind or thinking about other agents that exist that might be like you that you need to communicate with. Intentionality of signaling. Uh, playfulness says that 
that there is a decision making process that enables a system to begin to go in and try to achieve things in the world that might not be related to its primary objectives. Uh, all these things sort of blend together, and I, I really like where we went with that. So I'll, uh, I'll I'll present some some one one tool that maybe you can use to contextualize all of those things we just talked about and, and things to talk about further. Um, I, I like to use this tool. I think this is very helpful, especially when talking to a, a cross-disciplinary audience. So uh, I'll present it to you as sort of an offering and, and you don't have to use it. I'm not saying that this is how you should characterize uh, the hallmarks of intelligence, but I do think that 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 we, we see an interplay between data or information and goals and the, and decisions that sort of broker the exchange exchange of those things. So these are three big big things, like the, 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 the data, the goals and the decisions. And moving through these, oh, there we go, uh, the three three general processes, intelligent processes that I consider to be the, the hallmarks of intelligence. If I were speaking to a, a purely uh, computing science audience that was trained in the art of reinforcement learning, I, I would call this probably representation, prediction, and control. But for, for more of a broad audience, I would say that there are these processes that, that build this continuum from data to, to the achievement of goals or the uh, the attainment of goals in, in the world and, and the decisions that, that help that process happen. One is perception, the idea that there are some kind of sensory motor inputs which are turned into something that we, we might consider to be the, the fuel for decision making by the agent. Um, the next thing is that perception being used to, to make predictions. And by prediction, I, I do, maybe this is something you also picked up from Rich, but the prediction is intimately connected to the idea of knowledge or the uh, ability of a system to, to form some kind of understanding of the patterns that unfold in both time and space around it and be able to forecast what might not happen, what might happen next with respect to its understanding of those patterns. And then using the perception and that knowledge of those predictions about the sensory motor future to, to in fact take actions or make decisions in the world. So I'll just say this one more time again, is that I, I, I think a useful tool for talking about and thinking about artificial intelligence, especially in a cross-disciplinary audience, is to think about what data is involved, uh, the, the goals that are trying to be that are trying to be achieved, the decisions that are going to that are going to connect those two, and then how perception, prediction, and action in fact support that that trajectory through through the space from from inputs to outputs. Cool. Is that is everyone okay with that for now? That's a, a, just a tool I'll, I'll give you today that you you can choose to use or not use. Um, and because then that, that goes to sort of like I like to then play this game, and it's a little harder because I, I can't see all of you at the same time. But I'm just going to go rapid fire as fast as I can, given the, the latencies here. Go through some slides, and we're going to play a little game of intelligent or not. So uh, you just have to say like thumbs up, thumbs down on the on your video feeds, or just or or wherever you are, even to yourself, intelligent or not. Uh, first candidate for intelligent or not is this toaster. Okay, I see some thumbs down. Okay, that's very cool. Thank you all for participating. I see a thumbs up. That's awesome. Uh, okay, cool. Next, robot vacuum cleaner. Oh, oh, I see some tentative thumbs up and thumbs down. We got sort of a mixed bag here. This is good. Okay, very nice, very nice. Everyone's fine. I'd like to say, mind you, oh, we just got a new robot vacuum cleaner. It can like match the house. It says, hey, do you want me to clean a little more by your couch? I didn't even tell it I had a couch. Okay. Uh, this thing, one of these like smart speakers that we probably have everywhere. One's probably listening to me right now. Okay, smart speakers are not smart or smart, depending on part of it. Okay, this is a very mixed crowd today. I really enjoyed this. Thank you all for participating in this game. Um, okay, next candidate is this. Oh, yeah, now I think probably a thumbs down. That's, yeah, okay, good. Uh, all right, and one of these things, you know, like they walk around, they, they can talk in 15 languages, they can pick up trash, put it in a garbage can. <laughs> tentative, tentative thumb raises every sort of like, mm. yeah, okay, very cool. Uh, all right, so that was a fun game. Thank you all for playing that game with me. I, I one of my favorite things about giving this talk uh, at different times and to different audiences is to see oh more people in my front yard. Very cool. All right, that's what for posterity on Kim's video feed. Um, so the uh, uh, the one thing I really enjoy about this is that different crowds will have different responses. And so when I give this to the general public versus a specialist audience, like there's some really hard crowds here where you're like, oh, wow, none of those things even remotely fulfill my like, objectives of intelligence, including the speaker of this talk. Uh, but in some crowd, crowds like, oh, my goodness, yeah, that, that toaster is like, wow, it doesn't burn my toast. So I, I like to use this part of the talk to dispel some common misconceptions. And, and the first is that 
intelligence is like arguably like especially with artificial intelligence that things are either artificial intelligence or they're not it's sort of this this like two-way dichotomy which is like either it is or it isn't i think often i see a common mistake i see in, in the general public or in the media or even among our, our experts in the various fields i interact with is that um all of the things i showed you are classified as AI. These things are like the epitome of advanced technology, and they all have the same kind of social implications, consequences, risks, and benefits. Clearly, I think we'd all agree, based on the thumbs up and down, that that probably that the existential threat from a toaster versus a uh, an Aldebar and now robot is, is is quite different. But but I think this is one of the misconceptions that these are all grouped together. Um, the second misconception that I think is that once we get a little to know these kind of technologies a bit better is that what we usually do is sort of spread them out along that same line. We don't even just, we, we keep the line intelligent. It's like now it's not just a yes or no question. It's like a, a, a single, single continuum. And that at a certain point, things along that line are just appliances. Now, you know, they're not really that intelligent. Those are appliances. There's a robot upstairs that can like map my entire house. It's not that intelligent. Uh, it's an appliance, but oh, wow, that thing that can talk like multiple languages and pick up trash, that's clearly intelligent. So like that there is this, this sort of continuum and then people start putting arbitrary lines along it to say, well, after a certain point, that's AI. Everything below that is now, is now you know, it's an appliance. If I asked you this 50 years ago, all of this would be AI probably uh, and, and none of it would be appliances. So I'd like us to think about this. This is how I, I would say that if you're ever faced with this and especially when you're working across many disciplines to help dispel those misconceptions is to think about uh, the different angles of, of machine intelligence or intelligence in general. Like, can a robot vacuum cleaner map my house to a greater precision than I can? Maybe. Does the toaster do a better job of not burning toast than I do? Absolutely. Um, can I speak all the languages that the, the Aldebaran now can? No. Um, can I do math to the same degree as, say, a supercomputer cluster that I can access through my smart speaker? Well, also probably no. Um, and can I fold proteins with my mind? Probably not, but we have computers that can do that now. So think about the different axes of intelligence that we might be thinking about and then reflect on, especially with respect to the particular task at hand or the particular setting, what are the data, the decisions and the goals that are that are involved in this processing and what, what kind of perception, prediction and action are being considered for the device in question. Let's say this is artificial limbs. This is the area where I work. Um, we might say, okay, what kind of information does this artificial limb take in about what the person wants and what they need? What are the goals of this interaction? Well, we want to improve like the ability of someone to do tasks of functional tasks of daily living and feel it's intuitive to do so. What decisions does the system make? Well, it has to figure out whether to open and close its hand and whether to switch which kind of grip it has. Cool. Okay, neat. How would how does that data turn into perception for the machine? What kind of knowledge does it build up or what kind of predictions does it make? And what kind of actions can it form in service of those goals? Uh, oh, the system can like move the motors. Okay, cool. We're dealing with motors or we're dealing with composites of motors. So anyway, that's just one example of how I think it's really important to break down a problem into its fundamental elements. And now you can use that sort of that little crib sheet of, of breakdowns I have in the top right corner here. You can make your own based on what you've learned in this course or, or the other reading and study that you do. But I think it's helpful to do this kind of thing when you're pursuing artificial intelligence as a, as a way to engage in different, especially different medical or biomedical problems. Cool. So why do we care about machine intelligence? Like, so we, we just did sort of like a what it is, and I gave you a bit of a value pitch at the beginning, but why do we care? Um, people generally care uh, because machine intelligence in general gives us en enhanced control over this wild, squishy world we live in. Especially right now, I've, I'm sure we all are feeling a lot of, of instability or inconsistency in the world around us. And so machine intelligence gives us a little bit of enhanced control over that. Uh, Something that we've wanted to do for a very long time is anticipate the future. This is built into the, the past history of, the, of, of, of humanity, is trying to forecast the future. And machine intelligence gives us some of the tools to do that. And it gives us general tools for solving hard problems. And I think you've all seen that how this is, uh, how this is played out in things like finance and healthcare, energy, transport, resources, all sorts of information processing. I'm sure you've had awesome lectures all through this entire course so far about those things. And you'll, you'll hear more about it in the, in the months to come. So this is, I think, why people care about machine intelligence and why you might care if you didn't already. Maybe you already do because you're already part of this course, but maybe you still don't care, in which case I ask you to consider these. Um, and then the question like, is why learning? And this is, I, I broached it with the slide of my, my ex-master student, Gotham Vassen, who is like uh, shaking hands with this robot arm. And the robot arm did, let's be honest, a very aw awful job of shaking hands. Gotham's great at shaking hands. This robot arm did a very bad job of it. And it's really hard for me to even think about how I might program a robot arm to give a good handshake. But I might be able to ask it to learn how to give one. 
And so this is sort of my motivating example for the uh, for the why why would it not just machine intelligence, but why learning? And this was brought up when we talked about hallmarks earlier. Someone said, "Oh, learning is really important," and I 100% agree. Um, and why might we consider machine learning? We might uh, we might know what we want to want to do, but we might not not be not sure how we want to get there. I might know what a good handshake feels like or how I could imagine Gotham, my student, giving me a really good, a good like, yeah, that gave a great handshake. But we might not know how to program that system to be able to give the handshake. It could learn. Um, we might know how to program a good handshake for a robot, but the second that its motors age or that we uh, we change its setting of use or we take it outdoors in the winter, that it, it actually changes. And we have to rewrite all of that excellent handshaking code that we, we wrote earlier. So scaling up might be really, really tricky or impossible. Even if we know how to solve a problem, we might need learning to scale. And uh, th maybe the most critical one, I think, for a lot of the work that all of us will do in the future is that uh, the world changes and systems need to adapt. And so learning is a really effective way for a system to begin to adapt to a wild, squishy, changing world. Okay, cool. I'm gonna take a bit of a breather here because as you as you know, Kim knows especially, I talk very, very fast and I, I cover a lot of ground when I, I'm going through this. So uh, before I jump into sort of the breakdown I have for AI medicine, I just wanna ask, are there any questions? Does anyone wanna jump in and, and have any comments at this point while I take a drink of water? So maybe I would reflect on Patrick's lectures over the past uh, 10 years and, and some of the excitement in, in them when he's actually in the teaching room, he would sit on the back of a chair and sort of balance himself there and <laughs> for like the whole lecture. <laughs> it was so riveting because you kept thinking he's going to fall off, you know, but but he never did. So, yeah, he, he, yeah. He, yeah. <laughs> I know that the deep intellectual content in what I just said was sort of limited, but on the other hand, you want to know, does this course give you endorphin flow or not? Right? I mean, that's an important metric. <laughs> and, and, and Patrick is sort of the peak of the lab MP 590 endorphin flow. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to disappoint Kim, but I'm literally sitting on my floor. I've been sitting cross-legged on the floor since the pandemic started. I gave up chairs because they were silly. Um, and so I just like sit on the floor on, a, on some pillows. So even if I did fall off my small yoga pillow here, it would actually not be that impressive unless this whole screen behind me came crashing down and the ghost storms went everywhere. Right, um, but right. uh, yeah. yeah, so that's the, the amount of risk. I'll give you a little risk. I'm going to start. There we go. Who knows that ghost I'm going to fall off my go board? Who knows? Okay. Um, that story, we all have to make accommodations for COVID, I guess. Um, there we go. All right. <laughs> that made me worry. Okay, cool. So I'm going to jump in. If there's no, are there any other questions? Uh, that was a great, great water break for me as well. Okay, cool. We, we, again, we'll have time for questions at the end. So, um, this is the point where I try to ground what we've done. Like we just went through, like, let me say again what we just did. So we we went through a series of motivating examples where assisted biomedical technology was interacting with the human body and where machine learning, machine intelligence or AI or some simple form of intelligent systems technology was brokering that relationship, was allowing the, the machine and the person to work well together to do something that was important to the daily life for the person that was using the device. So we just use that as examples and then sort of solidified what I consider to be the, the sort of the core propositions that machine intelligence and AI is in fact the critical mediator of interactions between humans, biological humans and the, and the myriad technologies that support us in our daily life. Okay. So I did that. Uh, we then hopped in and actually tried to say, well, what is that intelligence thing anyway? And why should we care? Uh, we, we broke it down into a series of, of hallmarks or nice ways to make decisions and, and engage in discussion regarding intelligent systems technology and in a medical context and played that fun game of, uh, of is this thing intelligent or not? Um, then we stepped in a little bit more, more detail to actually talk very precisely and specifically about why people care about machine intelligence, why people care about machine learning in particular. Okay, so that's what we did. And now I, I'm going to go into a breakdown that, again, I, I'm not suggesting is the way that you, you always should think about AI medicine, but I'll give you a helpful sort of 
tool to break down the different uses of artificial intelligence in, in medicine and, and help give you some, at least a, a starting point to, to contextualize the work that's been done in those areas. Um, and I have them in three broad categories that, again, are by no, by no means uh, discrete categories. There's a lot of overlap, as I'll show you in the slides that follow. But generalization, personalization, and optimization are sort of the, the, the three sort of catchy rhyming things that I, I, uh, I have put forward here. And with respect to generalization, I mean helping that AI and machine learning and medicine help us to understand whole patient populations. It might be all of the all of the kinds of one species, like all humans or all cats on the planet. Um, it might be some subsets of the population, but generalization helps us understand the, some of the, the base principles or phenomena in patient populations. There is personalization. And by this, I mean using and contextualizing individual patients with respect to those the, what we know about larger patient population, populations and helping to customize our interpretation of what's happening in my front yard with respect to those populations. <laughs> I have no idea how to actually make my iPad not do this. So I hope you're all okay with just randomly seeing snapshots of my front door. Cool, okay. Um, and finally, helping choose and improve interventions. And this, by this, I, I, I call this optimization, but that's really understanding the relationship between individual patients and whole patient populations, and then trying to optimize either how we connect patients to interventions or how we deploy and, and assess treatment strategies in that setting. So this is the optimization of care to individuals. Is that okay, those, three, those general three categories? Um, one example I, I like to use for sort of the, the generalization is the Human Connectome Project. I don't know if anyone's gone to check out the Human Connectome Project. Again, the link is here. But really beautiful pictures of how all the parts of the brain connect to all the other parts of the brain. The brain bone's connected to the brain bone, the other brain. Anyway, this bit's connected to that bit. You can see the flow of, of connections inside inside the, the human brain. And this is really exciting. And it is, again, I say the human brain. This is a, an attempt to understand how brain regions connect to brain regions in the brain. Not necessarily, although not limiting out like your brain or your brain or Kim's brain or my brain, but thinking about the brain. Um, clearly, this is something that you can imagine being an act of generalization using advanced machine technology to start to understand the mapping of, of, of the, the mind that we all use in different ways. Um, another example of this is, is uh, and I'll just start to use this example. I know, Kim, you wanted me to, to at least bring in a little bit of AlphaFold. And I, I think that um, some of you have, of course, I'm sure bumped into AlphaFold. I think it's one of the most exciting discoveries using artificial intelligence in the history of artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm again, biased. This work that came out of deep mind, full disclaimer. I didn't work on it, though. So other undisclaimer. Anyway, I am really jazzed about this work. And I, I like you may have seen there was the uh, the paper recently in Nature on uh, using a large neural network, a system that, that using cross attention mechanisms and, and a whole bunch of really, really elegant feature processing and output processing is able to effectively fold the entire human proteome. This is taking the taking the actual sequence of all the proteins in the in the human proteome. This is again all of the proteins known about the about the human body and actually showing the 3D structures that those proteins will make when you actually let them out into the wild. Um, this is what was shown. This is one of like it is saying something in general about biology. And in fact one of the the goals of that the the proteome work that was mentioned in the nature paper is that uh, by sometime very soon, maybe Christmas or in the new year, the intent is to have every single protein known to biology folded such that you can see its three-dimensional structure. This is all open sourced. If you want, you can go to, there's a link at the bottom there, the alphafold.ebiac.uk. You can go browse the structure libraries. You can download AlphaFold and run it for yourself. Uh, but again, this is a case of machine intelligence and AI being used to do something that is saying something in general about whole populations how proteins fold, the building blocks of biology, how those proteins fold. There's new work that just came out literally today. So I put it in the slide as well. What I'm showing you there is the uh, AlphaFold Multimer. This is just released in BioArchive and it is actually showing how proteins fold together. So multiple protein structures that actually interact together and showing the ability to forecast the three-dimensional structures and machinery that they make. In this case, just uh, I think it's the uh, heterodimer. So you have two different proteins that are connecting together. So this is really exciting work. Again, saying something in general about patient populations, about how different cells structures might bind to different drugs or respond to treatments, or how we might understand different medical conditions.
Uh, on the other side is another paper that this again was also some work from DeepMind. Again, so this is this is my saying cool things that DeepMind did in the medical arena slide. It's the only one of them I have. I promise. I think I promise. I think I think I promise. Um, and this is like looking at at something more close to personalization, which was for uh, dealing with eye diseases. Looking at using deep neural networks to assess very rapidly uh, an individual patient's uh, the state of their eyes. The, the, their eye health and eye disease and being able to, to with the same degree of, of competency as doctors with decades of experience, be able to say whether or not there were issues with that person uh, that they might need to have addressed and what kind of issues those might be. So in very lay terms. So this is a case of knowing something, using AI to know something about patients in general and connecting that to know something about patients in a very personal sense. So how that person individually might be presenting. Um, I'll go a little bit more into personalization. This is some work, and now I'm citing some work by Neuralink. I'm sure many of you have seen this uh, work by Elon Musk's company to develop the next generation of, of direct brain machine interfaces. Uh, here you can see an example of electrodes actually being implanted into the, the surface of a, of a brain. Um, and like, I'll just put this slide up here. Literally what Neuralink is doing is building a sewing machine and a trepanning machine that will cut a tiny hole in a, in a skull, go in there and like with a sewing machine actually thread flexible electrodes into the surface of the brain while dodging all of the blood vessels and things that might break. Um, that's again a very lay summary. What the output is, and I, I believe that they now have uh, some solid demonstrations of wireless technology as well, is uh, single single electrode recordings, thousands of them in real time that can be piped out of the brain using a USB-C connector or again, I think wireless. So this is a, a new generation of being able to send, take information out of the brain and potentially send information back into the brain. This is of course, requires knowing something in general about brains, but it also requires a, a dollop of machine intelligence to be able to start to personally insert electrodes into a brain. And the technologies that come out of this are very personal. This is like going towards the optimization where we can start to see technologies that take signals from specific regions for a specific individual. Um, again, just in case you don't believe me, here is like some of the images of the sewing machine actually like threading these electrodes into the neuro, into the surface of, of tissue. Um, cool. Everyone's like, ah, oh, that's like, that's terrifying. Or that's really cool. Or wow, it's so altered carbon. Yeah, it could be all of those things. Um, uh, there's also work uh, here. This I'm showing some work with, with Brown and a collaboration with Intel AI, looking at helping to address spinal cord injuries. And here are the idea is that a piece of uh, a piece of very sensitive biomedical technology, electrodes, are implanted above and below a break in the spinal cord, still the central nervous system, and where artificial intelligence in in chip form is actually using is being used to help broker that relationship between part of the spinal cord and the other part of the spinal cord. So this is slightly different than what I showed you with the Neuralink example, where Neuralink, and it's not just Neuralink, there's also paradromics, there's a number of, of companies that are looking at high density neural recording. Um, this is one example of how that neural recording isn't just going to an output assistive device, but it's actually like with that functional electrical stimulation example earlier, is actually bridging the human body to the human body or an animal body to animal body in general. Uh, I spoke earlier about osseo integration. This is another slide from uh, Nax or Tiz Catalan and the team that was in New England Journal of Medicine. I really like this work. I think it's very cool. Um, we're also doing osseo integration surgeries now here in Alberta, thanks to the hard work of Jacqueline Hebert, uh, my collaborator and, and teams. But this is work by Max from not from the University of Alberta that is showing how someone might integrate a prosthetic device directly into the bone structure of the body, literally hollow out a bone in the residual limb, hammer in and attach a implant that is now a physical mounting point for a robotic prosthesis. And what, what uh, Max's team here has done is actually run wires then through that anchor point such that you can actually electrically, electrically connect that physically connected prosthesis to the sensory and motor uh, nerves and muscles. So essentially like input output matching. So not just physically coupling a device to a person, but electrically coupling it to their nervous system and their musculature. This is really exciting and not surprisingly, machine intelligence is important for understanding the patterns flowing to and from this. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll show one more example here. Uh, this is from a, a, a startup Sanctuary AI, but there's a number of avatar startups as well that are, that are sort of populating the world right now. But the idea that you might actually project the human human intent into a body that is not exactly physically coupled, still tightly coupled, but tightly coupled at a distance. So we're starting to see humans now actually beginning to interact with avatars and avatar-like uh, constructs in the same way that you might imagine someone using a brain machine interface to control a, a prosthetic limb or a wheelchair. You might also imagine a person actually piloting a separate physically decoupled body of one form or another.
Cool. I, I did mention this earlier. I just want to say it again. There's been some Awesome work here at the University of Alberta. Also looking at, in this case, lower limb osseointegration in our Blink Lab here at the University of Alberta, which is directed by Jacqueline Hebert. Um, and, and our team in the Blink Lab is doing some really cool stuff. So I want to give a shout out to the Blink Lab, but I like giving talks where I focus on other people's work. So I'm going to minimize the amount of time I talk about the cool things that we're doing over in the Case Building um, and, uh, and the Glen Rose. Uh, but we do do some cool stuff, like all sorts of neat stuff, I promise, but not for today. Okay. Ha! Huh. Breath time. And then I will get get to the com the controversial slide of the talk uh, and then we'll we'll wind it home and we can have a, a reasonable amount of time for discussion uh, so let me say this and then we can and then we can move on to the next piece is that uh, I really believe that we're coming to a, a step change in how we think about medical care um, I'm not a MD so I probably should have no grounds to say this so you can all ignore everything I'm saying the real doctors can uh, can come in and tell tell you what they think about it but I, I do believe this is this is well based in, in in the landscape that we're seeing and the, and the shape that the changing shape of the medical landscape but that uh, we really are moving into a world of complex bodies and multidisciplinary care and and the way I motivate this is like looking at the examples I've shown you earlier if a patient's body, and a patient's mind, I say both of those things, um, they could be separate or the same. I'm not actually gonna take a position there. You can choose which one you want to think about. Uh, if a patient's body and mind are comprised in both biology and technology, then the question that is really still the open question is how best do we treat the whole patient? This is something that's really important, treating the whole patient, I believe. Um, my medical colleagues are also passionate about this. And so how do we treat the whole patient if the whole patient is more than our expected setting of biology? Um, if we look at our, our patients who do integrate technology into their, their daily life, um, many patients may, and in fact, do consider technology to be part of themselves. If you try to take out someone's pacemaker, I think they'd have defined opinions about that. If someone has a very good functional artificial limb and they're no longer able to access that limb, if someone has a vision prosthesis and suddenly they're unable to use their vision prosthesis as some of the, the very negative examples from much earlier in our, our journey through brain machine interfaces as a species pointed out that people will in fact consider their technology to be part of themselves. If I took any of your iPhones right now or your smartphones, I smashed them with a hammer. I think you'd also have very defined opinions and you probably have like heart palpitations based on that uh, because we all attach to our technology in different ways. And I think this is becoming especially critical in the medical arena. Um, and, and this is also, the next point is also very pressing then is that biology and technology may not be easily separable. Like this is not a thing that you can just say, oh, okay, it's cool, we'll give back your hand. Um, and as we start to see even tighter and tighter integration, if you have someone that's like sewing machined a neural interface into the brain, it's not easy just to unseparate those wires. Like that may not be a straightforward thing to do. And because of that, biological and technical care may also not be easily separable. Um, normal care, I expect, really I do expect this and why what you're all doing and studying here is so critical. And the fact that you come from many disciplines, I, thanks again for that, that sort of scan of your different disciplines earlier on, is that you will, like if you go into medicine, you'll likely all be working together, um, is that care may soon not just, and especially in physiatry, might not just involve t experts in things like tissue, or mus muscles and nerves and bones, but hardware, software and data science. Like you go into the clinic with an artificial limb, you may need someone to update the firmware of your limb. And you also might need someone to change the fitting of your socket housing, or you might need someone to go in and actually revise your bone and muscle tissue to better, better accept that, that particular prosthesis. And that revision may include implanting new technologies that require an electrical engineer and a data scientist. So I think this is a very, a, a very different world I think we're moving into. And I think it's going to be very exciting and very important for, for advanced patient care. Um, but at the same time, it does mean that our way of doing things is going to change and it may change radically. Um, I think you all, I, I, I like to show the slide. I think you all know what the robots are up to these days. Almost all of you are on the Twitters and stuff and you've watched. This is an older video from Boston Dynamics, but I still like this one, even though there's like cool parkour, parkour robots. But like, especially when I show this to my clinical colleagues, they're like, oh, wow, robots have come along a long way, haven't they? I'm like, yeah, yes, Boston Dynamics has all sorts of cool videos of robots doing dances and parkour. But like, I can't do backflips anymore like that. I used to be able to, but this is what the robots are, are up to these days. And there, there we go. Um, there's the blooper reel of this that always is in the Boston Dynamics videos where it's gonna like face plant. Um, so let's watch that too, just to make you all feel better about the robotic world. Um, okay. Three, two, one, robot. Oh, 
that one wasn't quite so good. Uh oh, uh oh. But look at that correction. Look at that step correction. Like robots when I was growing up, like would have totally like okay, that would have cost like seven hundred million dollars worth of damage if this happened like three decades ago when I first started playing with robots. Um, okay, so I, I I didn't just show you that because I think robots are cool. I wanted to show you like neat Boston Dynamics robots doing jumps, but I showed you that because I didn't show you yet exoskeletons. Um, these are examples of people who might have some kind of mobility difficulties with a robot strapped on externally to their body. And I use this, this video paired with the last one to make a point is that the, the limitations right now are not in fact the robotics. You just saw a robot doing backflips. So I think we can all argue robots can do a lot of locomotion. You saw the, you saw the step correction and that blooper reel. Um, and like the, the way that we interface with the human body is also getting much more advanced. You saw sewing machines that are putting wires into the central nervous system and chips in the spinal column. It's the glue that holds those things together, the advanced technologies we have in the mechatronics and automation and the, the, the way that we can interact with the human body. There's missing glue. And, and my argument is still from the very beginning of the talk that in fact, machine intelligence is that glue. This is why we should care about AI and medicine. And it's not just why we should care about AI and medicine and physiatry. Again, I, I talked about this diverse sensory motor space coming into and out of the human body and into and out of the assistive machines and how AI forms the glue that holds these things together, machine intelligence, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Um, but I made a broader point. And when I go back to the slide I, I presented on generalization, personalization, optimization, is that really this is a process of using artificial intelligence to extend, extend our mind, our intent, and our, our information processing, our ability to perceive, to act, and to think about the world, to extend our minds out into the rest of the world and this diverse, this diverse stream of information we've now created for ourselves. And this, we've talked about the impact on patients. I've given you mostly patient-facing examples, but I think easily you can replicate this to thinking about how those same technologies might benefit caregivers, just think about someone using an exoskeleton moving a patient from bed to bed in a hospital. Or policymakers, think about the knowledge of the entire human proteome and how that affects global public health responses. We've already seen how that exactly plays out. So I think that we are using AI in a medical arena to extend not just our own, our own ability as, as, like, as users, so patients or other people using technology, but, uh, but as caregivers and as policymakers or high level decision makers. This is the way that we can extend ourselves out into the world. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I, as I promised, we have 20 minutes for questions. We don't have to use it all um, if you don't want to. But uh, but now I'll, I'll stop and and let us have a little bit of a discussion. Okay. Any questions? Comments? <laughs> yeah. To be clear, if your question is how exactly does AlphaFold work? I didn't work on AlphaFold, so I will only give you generalities and point you to the papers. Uh, it's quite cool uh, and relies on like self-attention models, but yeah. Oh, what I um, say oh. about uh, AlphaFold is that it is something that is not really completely understandable by the uh, human brain. It's sort of beyond what we can, you know, conceptualize. So. It, it's it's uh, in, in, in a very general sense, you know, AI being smarter than we, we are and understanding something we can never completely understand. Yeah. So, Which sorry. I think, Kim, I'll just try Somebody, I know you had a, I know you had a, que a question as well. I'll just respond to that and say that. This is really compatible with that, that multi-axis slide on intelligence I showed earlier, which is to say that like, my like Google Sheets or your Excel, your Excel spreadsheet is probably better at doing rote math than you are. Um, and it has been for some time. I don't know about the rest of you, but long division is not something I practiced for a long time. So we, we do see these axes of competency and then the, the, the degree of, of distance on that vector of competency. I think that's a really, Kim, you're making a really solid point here, which is that with AlphaFold, we are seeing a particular vector of competency that like it would take an entire graduate degree to maybe sequence like to actually do the crystallography analysis for one protein structure to try to understand what the protein's three dimensional structure was from its its base sort of like its base alphabet. Um, and now we see that a system can do that, that in like, I don't know what, an hour? I don't know, don't quote me on the exact time, but it's not very long. Like you could do a bunch of them in a weekend. Um, and so this is like a, an extension of competency along that one axis. But is it going to know that your like couch needs to be vacuumed? No, absolutely not. Can it tell the best way to get to work or self-drive your car? Absolutely not. Does it know how to 
cook a souffle? A hundred percent not. And so this is like it's it's sort of the the breadth and the depth along any of those any of those particular vectors of competency at, with respect to things like what are the goals, what is the inputs, and what are the outputs. Like with respect to that that sort of breakdown I gave earlier, I think is really important to think about, especially when saying, "Wow, AlphaFold's so smart." Well, yeah, at this one thing, it's really really smart. That is very good, but but it with respect to the goals that it, it has. It's not at, it's not going to be doing backwards. Cool. Sorry, please. Uh, question. Uh, yeah, um, I, I had a question before, but now I have a question to this. Um, so do you think that there will be a time where the axes would merge? Because like, for example, like us as humans, we are able to do like maybe not as well as like an AI specialized in one of the axes, but we can do multiple of them, right? So what, do you think that it would merge? This is like not a well thought out question, but yes. <laughs> no, it's an awesome question. It fits in perfectly. Like I really like this question. Um, and it you'll see people talking about the quest for artificial general intelligence, whatever they mean, whatever they mean by that. AGI um, is usually how people talk about general intelligence and how they define that is usually well, everybody has different definitions of it. But the way I think about it, I'll just say the way I think about it, and again, I'm not presenting anyone else's opinion here except except my own, is that um, it, it's almost like those those sort of like the lines I the lines I, I presented. You can think of them almost like flashlights or laser beams. Like if you're in like a disco club, it's been a long time since I've been in a disco club, I'll be very honest. But I remember at one point there was like mist and there were lasers and things like that. Maybe it was when I was an undergrad. Anyway, uh, uh, when you have those lasers going through the mist, just picture those. I, you can think of that as a lot of our technologies right now. We do see the, these lasers, but sometimes you'd actually see like a fan of lasers going through the mist at like your dance club, or maybe even a cone of light. And so if you just keep that, that sort of metaphor in your mind, I think that a lot of the work that's being done today is in fact, like, making those point lights. Um, I think, I, Kim, maybe you were calling this earlier like narrow AI and, and general AI or some some other way of, of naming it. But I think what we're seeing is that the, the, the sort of uh, aperture, the window of those particular vectors is, is being actively widened by people to the point that, in fact, the starting points are trying to get wider as well. So this is getting, I think, I think a lot of the activity you're seeing is, is going towards more and more general forms of intelligence, especially like my Roomba upstairs is doing a great job now. This isn't a plug for iRobot. I just like, I was genuinely shocked when um, technology that was used, oh, I don't know, like decades ago, simultaneous localization and mapping is now actually on a robot. It took how many decades? But it's there. Pattern recognition, which was invented over 70 years now almost, is now being used in artificial limbs in the clinic. It only took 70 years to do it. But we're starting to see like widening of these bases. And the only thing that I think is is presenting, oh, two things are presenting challenge. One is it's really hard to start to think about, about broader domains of competency. And the other thing I think is, is limiting is like much like the, the light example, laser is a very high intensity collimated light. If you spread it out too far, it gets very, very weak. You're never going to bounce it off the moon and get the signal back. And so we are limited by compute. Compute is increasing at a rapid rate, but but things like compute and the way that we access our systems is still going to be a limitation, much like the number of photons you can pump out. You spread them all out or you put them in a collimated beam. Um, we're still limited by computronium. And even though we have, like, you probably saw Rich, I know Rich maybe gave you a slide with, like, did he do a talk on experience or did you talk on, like, Moore's Law and, like, the increasing of intelligence. Uh, Moore's law and the in, increase okay. of intelligence. So then you saw that. <laughs> See, then you saw this. That's my answer is that like, yeah, yes, that looks promising. But that doesn't mean that there's like, there's caps on the, on the, the there's, there's still resource constraints. Yeah. So that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That answers the question. But then I had another thing after. Uh, well, first of all, uh, fellow Hollow Knight fan, very nice. I love the little, <laughs> very good, <laughs> best game. Um, and also, I wanted to ask, um, what like you skipped over what your research was and stuff. So like maybe like if you could go into that. I'm sorry for um, yeah. Yes, thank you. It was two questions. I'm so sorry. <laughs> No, don't be sorry for questions. Questions are wonderful. Uh, and like like I said earlier, it's always, I, I've been enjoying lately talking about other people's work, but I also really do like the stuff we're doing. So uh, Dr. Jacqueline, Eve and I and our collaborators and our students are doing, well, we're, we're trying to build improved bionic limbs that are very intuitive. So these are devices that like people can actually control. Someone with an amputation might be able to very intuitively do something like catch a ball or or hold, hold, their, hold their child or their dog. 
or to be able to perform very detailed and self-driven activities of daily living. Uh, right now, prostheses are really limited. And so what we're looking at is, is using our, one aspect of our lab's work, at least, is looking at using artificial intelligence in the form of things like reinforcement learning and, and, and like real-time machine learning, like machines that can adapt and learn and change over time in response to individual needs, using those systems within, within upper limb prostheses to, to build truly intuitive, truly responsive bionic limbs. So making the, uh, maybe the easy way to say it is that artificial limbs are a tool. People have to learn to use them. And it's time that the tool start pulling some of its own weight and actually start to learn about the person in ways that can, can improve that connection between them, really fitting to that slide I showed earlier, the, the technology and the person. How can they co-adapt together to become even more than the sum of their parts? And that's so, the, the, um, you know. If you were to unshare your slides, then we would see the pictures of the students bigger, you know? <laughs> and that that I would love to do that. That, that would be great. Yeah. So let's Oh, that would be great. I, I agree with you. That definitive I... action. Yeah. There All right. the students are really enlarged. Yeah. And you're less likely to see my front door camera. Yep, that's awesome. <laughs> I all of these things are good. Uh, I just have to figure out how to get out of that. Am I still attached twice to Zoom? I probably am, right? Probably. Okay, I'm gonna leave. Okay, I'm leaving meeting with my other self. Now there's only one of me. Okay, cool. Thank goodness. Yeah. Wow, look at that. <laughs> now the students are completely manifest. Yeah, they're, they're, they are themselves now. Yeah, so that's, that's good. Hello, I have a question. So, sure. I saw thought of something that we discussed, I think in our first class. Um, uh, Dr. Solas was talking about how in the future, if prosthetic limbs become like really, really advanced, some people might choose to like uh, chop off their own arm and then get a prosthetic limb instead, just because they could like do so much more with it. What do you think of that? I think on the first level that we've got a lot of really tricky ethical choices as a species to make in the next couple of decades. And it's good that we're thinking about it early because these like these things are going to come up. I use the same example for custom made, uh, custom made pharmaceuticals. If you can 3D print drugs at home and you can download your own do it yourself recipe, um, what are you gonna be printing? Are you gonna have like people randomly printing like, I don't know, um, random, off the, uh, random off the internet COVID therapies for themselves? Of course they are, um, and some people won't. We have to think really hard as how we how we build new norms. And so the, the elective amputation question is also another question of societal norms. Um, I think there's like, there is a lot of medical community thought on this already with respect to like, if someone has their arm, but the arm doesn't work, should, should that actually be like, should there be an elective process for that where they could actually replace it with an arm that might actually open and close like uh, a hand that might open and close and I, Oh, wow. Okay. We have a cornucopia of visitors. Uh, hello, little puppy. Hi, puppy. Oh my goodness. And hello, little tiny human. Yay. Okay. All right. Thanks for the balloon animal, little buddy. Okay. Um, okay, I will, uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you, family. Thank you. Wow. Um, <laughs> no, that that's that's a, a good uh, humanizing feature. Yeah. We didn't. That has never happened before in one of your lectures. I don't no, think. I don't no, even think. Not, nope. Yeah. So this is good. The benefits of uh, of working home. So yeah. um, back to the, back to our serious topic, though. Um, clearly, clearly, balloon animals. Oh wait, no, no, our serious topic. That's right. Our serious topic was was on uh, was on the elective amputations. I think this is like a like there there is a continuum, but I think there's a there are people who consider there's a very compelling case for if someone had say severe muscle spasticity and was able unable to move their arm and there was no promise for them ever to be able to open and close their hand, and that was really important for their activities of, da of daily living. That whether or not they should be fitted with if they had good muscle signals, should they be fitted with a a myoelectric prosthesis that could open and close a hand. So that, and maybe even rotate a wrist, so they'd be able to do activities of daily living. I think that there would be like that clinical practitioners could have a reasoned discussion about that. Um, then I think like what we've talked about in our lab, like not with the cutting off limbs to be clear, but uh, things like building go go gadget wrists. One time we had a project that we still have on our shelf somewhere, which is a telescoping forearm prosthesis. This is a prosthesis that, like, if, you, if a person could learn to control it, if someone had an amputation due to injury or illness, and you fitted them with a telescoping forearm, a go go gadget arm, they could actually reach out and extend out, and their arm would maybe extend all the way out to like where the camera is positioned in front of me. 
I can't do that with my bottle of alchalim. That's an advantage. That's a, an enhancement. Um, we also looked at a, a prosthetic falcon quadcopter that you could control with a myoelectric gyre. Essentially, you could like fly fly the quadcopter using your muscle signals. And now your like arm is a distributed thing that can fly across the room and like give, bring back your cup of tea or a pencil or something like that. So, I mean, those are augmentations. They are things that you could say, what is the benefit? What is the risk? What are the trade-offs? And I think building societal norms that help us think really well on like, what are the goals? What are we like, what are the inputs? What are the outputs? What are the goals of this? And how do we feel as a society about those particular things? Um, certain places, this will just happen. Yeah. And we have to understand how we're gonna deal with it. <laughs> so, you know, if, if this seems extreme to you, just compare it then to the idea of uh, mind uploading, which uh, Kurzweil says um, will be widespread and successful in the 2030s. <laughs> I, I think uh, the psychiatric side effects of that is so severe that, that, that no one will want to do it. Not only that, but the first person to do it no one else will believe the self-report from that person, right? Because they'll be under such pressure to, to report that, that it's great, you know? Now, now they're living in this ceramic slab. They, they can travel in space at the speed of light, but they have no biological body whatsoever. It's just the best thing ever. Nobody will believe that because <laughs> you know, the, 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 the world is sort of waiting for this uh, report and, and, and you can't imagine the sort of unbiased circumstance, right? So probably it'll take a lot longer, but like you can dial up any emotion, including a lot that no human has ever experienced. You know, there are all sorts of things that go way beyond what uh, Patrick's talking about. And maybe they will be possible in the 2030s, but I think probably no one will choose because we sort of like our, you know, biological bodies the way they are. And they, the idea of living in a ceramic slab would just take a lot of adjusting. Yep. Yeah, Kim, have you read, sorry, this is a digression. Have you read the book Walk Away? No, no. Okay, it's like, anyway, that is apropos, it's maybe worth worth reading. Um, Walk Away is an interesting, is, is, my wife recommended it. It's an interesting book. Uh, and it does involve uploading at some point. Okay, I, I think that like, it's gonna be hard, right? If you could go on the internet right now, find an instance of GPT-3, the large language model, and talk to it and say, are you an uploaded brain? It might be like, yeah, I totally am. And you could have a whole conversation with it. And that's right now. So would you believe, like if you were talking to someone who was uploaded, would you believe? Like they, they actually shut down an instance according to the internet, like the Twitter feeds. So like that is the level of citation I'll provide for this is that they dis discontinued the GPT-3 access to someone who tried to uh, reconstitute his uh, deceased fiance as a text, as a, as a chat engine uh, using this language model and was having conversations. So we already have that. That's, that's a thing that like, Someone, someone in some company made a decision to not be okay with, and it's already happening. Is that an upload? Is that a first example of upload? Maybe. So what, like, yeah, what, what do you think about that? I don't know. It's like, hey, large language model. Oh, hey, that's cool. Are you a person I just saw uploaded? Oh, I totally am. Oh, I believe you, little uh, sock puppet GP3. Like, I, I honestly don't, I have no idea what to think about that because it'll be yeah. very hard to piece things apart. So what you would like to think is that life is fair. And the thing that will convince you of that is that the best video about mind uploading has my seven-year-old uh, granddaughter playing a, a, a key role. And she's telling you what she thinks about it. And is it like playing, you know, video games is it like Minecraft or not? Or Yeah. So you, you can hear, hear the words of a seven-year-old about... Uh, mind uploading so there and the the person who handles pr for the faculty of medicine got so excited about that video 
that even though it's not about any big advance being made in the faculty of medicine, they wanted to feature it and sort of send it to everyone, you know, but luckily that didn't actually happen. It was really cool. Uh, yeah, we, we came close to doing that. Yes. Um, so this is going to be a rather speculative question, but do you think that direct neural interfaces will give a very nice opportunity for something like an AGI to come about since we humans already have the general intelligence aspect covered, but if we were able to say interface with a lot of these more specified and skilled machines or algorithms, do you think that's a viable thing in the future? Uh, I mean, my university research could be characterized as something else entirely, which is intelligence amplification. This goes back to the 1950s and 1960s. Thinkers like W. Ross Ashby and Licklider and Engelbart and others uh, were looking at ways to use technology to amplify our own cognitive abilities. It's not surprising. It's not weird. It's not something that we aren't already doing, like tools all around us. We use tools to amplify or augment our own abilities. I use a, I used to give a talk where I showed a stick as the first thing in the talk. And I was like, why are you giving a talk about a stick? Like, because it extends my ability, extends my reach, my ability to interact with the world. It extends my cognitive abilities and then I can now act on the world in different ways than I could before. And in a broader, I have a broader set of affordances. So I think that any kind of neural technology, especially this is where we're looking at prosthetic technologies and things like that, or neuroprosthetic technologies, is a potential for augmentation and amplification. I think it's just a natural, it's a natural consequence of us using tools, which makes it kind of boring. So I guess that says that tool use is, is good for increasing the capacity of a species. Um, but in this case, I do think neural interfaces are a very powerful tool, and that more specifically, artificial intelligence in the way we've talked about today is possibly the most tool. If we believe Kurtzville and like intelligence is the most powerful phenomenon in the universe, then artificial intelligence is the most powerful tool that we could imagine creating. If we, again, just basing on, on Kurtzville. So in that case, if you connect that to yourself and are you able to use it flexibly as a tool in a way that is extending yourself, then yeah, that's a really powerful combination. Thank you. Okay, we've got one minute left. <laughs> in the teaching session. Yeah. Okay. I've been trying to think about how to word this question, but I guess I've just been thinking about how a lot of what we have with technology is just based off of what we're able to imagine. So I was wondering, I don't know, it's almost like if there was ever a point where technology stopped advancing, which I'm not sure there ever will be, will our imagination for what is possible also stop? I don't know if that makes sense. Well, the other part of it is, can machines imagine now? And, and you know, how, will they be better at imagining than we are? I, I think those, those are equally important. See if I can find a find a link here uh and i'm gonna be no i'm on the completely wrong never mind i'm on the wrong i'm on my ipad not this computer so i can't share the link i was gonna put it here um if you haven't seen the work of Revic anadol uh some really cool machine creativity and, and imagination work that i just wanted to flag on on to, to kim's point it's r-e-f-i-k-a-n-a-d-o-l if you haven't run into Revic anadol before um really cool stuff um and again machine imagination but i, I guess this also is a really great question. And it, I think, is goes back to the previous question on, on the amplification of our cognitive abilities. And I do mean all of our cognitive abilities. If we think about the dotted line of what's possible for us to imagine, as we widen our perception, our ability to act upon the world and think about the world, that dotted line of possibility continues to increase. And I think that the rate with which we increase that the dotted lines range and breadth and span, the volume that we encompass in, in our range of possibility grows more than linearly with the technologies that we extend ourselves with. And if technologies are also extending technologies themselves, I think we have a long time before we're gonna have to worry about reaching that outer boundary and pushing against uh, pushing against this invisible envelope that we can no longer extend. Because I think the rate of change is again, it's a multiplier or, or a, a, a exponential factor of the technologies versus the, the possibilities that we could reach with our creativity. So I think that I feel confident about that one. I feel good about that one, that, that we're in a good space, uh, that that one won't be, uh, won't be a limiting factor for us as a species for quite some time. I hope. Thank you.
Super. Okay. Well, thank you for a wonderful teaching session, uh, Patrick, and thanks to the students. And uh, yeah, so uh, onward and upward. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Thank you. thank you, everyone. Have a great one. And again, if you want the slides, they're on my website. Please feel free just to go to my website and grab we, the PDF. We'll find them. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you.